My name is Khulud Ore, and I'm VP of IT and CIO at the Urban Institute. And I'm joined today with two colleagues of uh, my team, uh, Jared Bishki, who's the manager for uh, IT strategic initiatives, and Laura Jensen, director of IT business planning and project management. Uh, they're gonna be joining me on stage to share actually their um, experience uh, with Lean at Urban. So, uh, Urban Institute is actually a nonprofit, a uh, nonpartisan uh, research institute. In the US, they call it also a think tank, but I prefer to call it research institute because I can't imagine putting people to think in a tank. I'm not sure where the term came from. Um, uh, the organization was started in late 60s uh, at uh, President Johnson time, and it was an initiative to really uh, address the problems uh, in urban and cities in America. Uh, poverty, community. Uh, so it started the journey almost 50 years ago to really address the complex issues facing our cities. Um, and as you know, we, the, the globe is really going urban. Uh, we expect more and more people to live in cities, uh, which makes actually the work of uh, places like urban more relevant uh, by the day. Uh, it has a great mission uh, to really open minds um, and shape decision and help policymakers uh, make decisions on social and economic policies. Uh, Urban Institute over the uh, last five decades um, established uh, what today has uh, nine policy centers in different areas, in justice, in health, um, uh, income and benefit, tax policy, um, housing and finance, um, it has two advisor groups. Uh, it has a number of uh, cross initiatives um, on poverty, on cities, uh, and we have today more than uh, 470 researchers um, or employees. Most of them, the majority, are really researchers and senior uh, scholars in different areas. Um, the work of Urban has been uh, over the years focusing on, on different uh, policies, as I said. And in the last three years, we had a new president who joined Urban. Um, she came from um, another uh, policy center that she actually helped co-found. Um, she worked with the Clinton administration um, on economic policy and uh, housing. Uh, Sarah Rosenthal joined us in 2012. And she had a new vision, or renewed the vision for urban, where she wants to take urban in the coming uh, 50 years, let's say. Uh, urban kind of bride itself in its uh, quality of work. Um, all our work is really evidence-based. Um, it's mainly economists and researchers, so they take pride, and uh, they care a lot for the topics and for the autonomy of the research and the results. Um, they try to be relevant and influential in the day-to-day -day policies um, of the uh, American local, uh, state, and federal government as well. So urban, as it kind of shapes its future, where we want to be in the coming 50 years, um, we looked around us and we realized that uh, we compete for three major things. Um, not just with other research institutes, but also with private sector, with consulting, with universities. Uh, we compete for funding um, as a nonprofit. Uh, we have to always apply for funds for our research and work, whether it's from the government or foundations. Uh, we compete for talents with the researchers. And we also compete for audience and influence um, and how we shape the decisions um, in the US. So this is kind of the new vision for urban, where we want really to be the go-to organization for economic and social policies through four major strategic objectives, which is to grow really our um, research and the quality of our research, and also to raise visibility and influence and impact on the decisions that are made um, on behalf of citizens, and also grow and increase our funding so we can really explore more problems and find more solutions. Um, and the end is also to improve the productivity and the infrastructure of the organization so we can deliver on all these strategic objectives. So in these four major areas, um, this is kind of the, the renewed vision, as I said, that focused um, our work in these four strategic areas that I 
consider them mutually enforcing. You can't really do, you can't really expand the research and try to do more analytics without um, increasing or taking care of the infrastructure and the execution um, of operations. Uh, at the same time, you can't really do much if we don't increase our funding and diversify it. So these four uh, strategic objectives, for example, under the extending and strengthening the research, um, there were two new policy centers that were established in the last three years at Urban. Uh, one is housing finance uh, policy center that focuses um, on the housing and mortgage industry, especially after the uh, financial uh, crash and the housing and the real estate crash in the US. Um, that policy center in particular focuses on creating models that um, evaluates mortgage to really identify mortgage uh, loans that are more vulnerable to or more likely to actually default. Um, and uh, in general, the different areas uh, uh, under these four strategic objectives, one key area was really to modernize the infrastructure, uh, to really strengthen the foundation of the organization so it can deliver on these strategic objectives. So all of that happens with really a need um, to modernize, modernize not just the infrastructure, but also the way we operate, because our competition is changing. Um, urban today is not just competing with think tanks, we're also competing with even small, um, smart uh, entrepreneurs and startups who have access to technology and big analytics. Uh, so the, the, the whole atmosphere is changing uh, for us. One of the areas that really Urban focused on at the beginning to really meet those uh, four strategic objectives is really the visibility uh, and how we tell our story, how we communicate the story that our numbers and our evidence-based research tells uh, beyond just publishing the report in a peer journal. How we can really take the story and segment it and target it and share it with larger audience and outreach. So one of the first areas that Urban really invested in was a new brand, which actually we're all proud. That's why we're wearing our shirts because uh, there has been great work at Urban to really create the new brand of it. And a lot of focus has been on the visualization, how you really tell a better story with the data that we have. So this was uh, Urban's kind of work uh, before the new branding. And then the second one, uh, this is Urban's today. This is our website today, which focuses a lot on visualization, uh, interactive tools. Um, there is a lot of uh, tools that for anybody you can go and you can um, see what it means to be in a certain community in Washington, D.C., um, how certain trends are changing over um, a timeline. Uh, so all of that really, to build it, was really faced with an extreme challenge, especially on the IT infrastructure side. For example, the, the uh, the map and the visuals that you saw in the previous one, which was released this year, um, everything in IT or in the organization was actually hosted on premise. Um, and we had an IT team who I would say did heroic work trying to keep and maintain all the existing infrastructure that supports um, the organization, whether it's in the research, etc. But that um, infrastructure has, not, has been underinvested in. So it ended up aging and not really capable of supporting this new vision and where we want to be. So for example, the interactive map, um, in the first six months when we had a new VP for communication, um, the, the, her team did a great project in creating an interactive map. Um, and the day it was launched, it actually brought the whole network down. It shut down our, si our website and we had millions of visitors who were going to visit the website that they could not access it. So that was kind of a wake-up call that we have to do something more if we really want to, to move forward with, um, with our modernization effort and uh, our strategic objectives. Just a couple of things also to mention besides the, um, uh, the interactive map. It has been also very difficult for um, our fundraising team to really know or have enough insights in their um, 
relationships with our funding or with donor organizations because we did not have a CRM system. To create a report, it required a full team, four or five, to really sit together a lot of manual processes and Excel sheets to get some um, uh, basic numbers for us to really uh, go and analyze where we are in terms of funding and pipeline, etc. So we've been missing uh, tons of opportunities, I would say, by having um, an aging infrastructure. Uh, and most importantly, imagine what could we do with, with, with the basic infrastructure that we have and the aging one. Urban still delivered great work. So it was all about imagining the possibilities, what it's going to look like if we actually move to newer, more recent technologies. Um, imagine, for example, having our uh, uh, fundraising group or our CEO going to meet with a foundation, um, and on their way, they click on an iPad and they got a history of our relationship with that foundation or with that donor. Um, imagine, for example, our tax policy center. Next year, we have um, elections, and Urban, one of its flagship products is what is called micro simulation models. So imagine if next year we have better technology and our centers are able to run their models and research uh, in, in a faster manner, in real time manner. Um, so imagine if next year, during the debate, we're able to take a tax proposal from one of the candidates, feed it into our model, and in real time um, run its impact on a single mother that has two kids, what it mean for, for her income and for her tax. Um, imagine also if we are able to um, have more automated processes and cut our cost in development to half if we have the right ERP systems in place. So that's what we were missing if we kept working with IT the way it is, uh, or the way it was, I would say. So this was a little bit beyond just modernization. Um, when I was hired, I joined Urban actually about 18 or 19 months ago. Um, and the role was really that I need to modernize IT, which some people will think you just need to upgrade a couple of systems here, get a new email system, new servers, and we'll be fine. Uh, but what I saw there was really beyond just the modernization, beyond an upgrade. Uh, it was way of transformation of the way an organization and a research institute work, and not just going with a new technology. Uh, because for a long time, the organization functioned in a certain way. It was stable, which is, I have to admit, that was a great thing to join an organization that is not really facing a disaster. Uh, but they really realized that there is a need for modernization and for changing so we can continue to deliver value. So in an organization that is, has been functioning in a certain way, having technologies that were not, I would say, updated for at least 20 years. For example, our finance accounting system was set up in the early 90s and it was still functioning in the same exact way. Um, so the people, the culture, how people have been used to do things, things have been working, not necessarily major disasters, but at least uh, our researchers, for example, got used to start running a model and do work for like two days, and in two days they will get the results of their model and then they will start analyzing. So the organization kind of started adjusting to certain processes that technology could have just really changed the whole way of how you work. Uh, so what I needed to do is I, actually called my colleague and coach and friend and mentor, um, Steve. And I called him, I said, well, this is way bigger than just what I was trying to, Grame in, to do in Grameen. Uh, uh, I think there is a great opportunity for me at Urban leading this transformation to benefit from Lean. And I think Lean could really help us go long ways. So he was generous enough and he joined us and he came um, to Urban Institute, and in 72 hours, I have to say, it was a record, he really made the case and got uh, helped me in actually getting the Urban's leadership uh, boat into uh, the lean. Uh, within the 72 hours, he met with the senior leadership, which is Sarah and John and Marge, um, and he told them about lean. It made so much sense to them, and they thought, well, this is worth trying. 
this is worth supporting. Uh, he also met with a number of uh, key business stakeholders, with research centers, with other VPs. He conducted a good analysis. Um, he conducted a workshop at the end and shared with uh, the organization kind of some views of how we can approach it and what does it mean. Um, and Lean, for some reason, um, although I was kind of talking about Agile, talking about other methods, but Lean in particular, I don't know, it registered more with leadership at Urban. And I think the main reason, because Lean is very scientific in its approach, and also it really aligned with Urban values, that it's all about evidence-based, it's about data, it's about seeing the results. Um, and actually, Urban does a lot of evaluation uh, for programs in the government about which programs are more effective than others. Uh, so we kind of learned also to spot waste in some of the programs and the policies. Um, so they found a lot of kind of common language even between Lean and its principles um, and the work that Urban does and its mission. So after these 72 hours, um, Actually, this was a product uh, that Steve had after the 72 hours, uh, which we mapped the value stream of Urban, and a research organization that is nonprofit. It start with applying for grants to do research and then deliver the research results, communicate an outreach to the public or to the funder, uh, which in many cases is a federal agency. And then it feeds again into kind of a future work and expanded work we want to do. So that was the value stream, uh, the way um, Steve and the different workshops we had helped us define. Um, and then we identified the various areas where a lot of this improvement and transformation needed in big major areas where this value stream flows from collaboration and knowledge management, and it's a knowledge organization, it's all about really knowledge and expertise, um, HR management, uh, how we apply for funding, how we manage proposals, um, how we manage projects, the grants, the research process itself. So these were all areas for improvement opportunities. And that was kind of the recommendation of how we can approach this major complex uh, transformation in everything we have in IT, whether it's a user technology or research technology, business system, um, or um, customer relationship management or CRM, um, website, social, uh, digital content, etc. So that was kind of how we envisioned we're going to approach it. And the, the main kind of strategic approach I took to modernize everything in IT beyond just, of course, our business systems or, or ERP uh, was really to take a bimodal IT approach. Um, there was no way I could just jump into the new and into all the latest technologies um, and invest in them and ignore the ongoing systems that need to be continue to operate and support the organization. So I had to go with an approach uh, that is bimodal, but I did not have the luxury of hiring a full new team. Um, I had to work with the existing team that is super committed, super smart. Uh, so actually my bimodal team is the same team. Um, every member almost on my team today wear two hats. Um, I keep telling them we're gonna be schizophrenic for a few years uh, until we really make the, the move to the modern IT and technology. Uh, but everybody in the team has two roles. One role is to keep things going and moving and operating and stable and secured. At the same time, they're all part of an agile process of implementing and modernizing IT. Um, the other thing is we started, that's where kind of the lean helped us. We started an initiative called Operational Excellence Initiative, which is to follow lean method to transform some of our key processes and how we operate. And that's the part that Jared and uh, Laura will share with you from their firsthand experience. Um, and then we had a big initiative to modernize all our business systems from accounting to HR, to uh, reporting, dashboards, CRM, et cetera and definitely a key component in the whole IT transformation was to really go with a cloud, and I think mobile is almost by default, but to go cloud first and mobile first. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it to Laura to share with you um, her experience bringing lean and agile into practice. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, Kalud obviously had a big task when she took over the IT team at Urban and she hired me to help establish a project management 
uh, practice for the organization. So what could possibly go wrong? I thought Urban is a small nonprofit organization, about 450 people, sounded manageable. Um, what I found when I got there was um, there was a, a blank canvas for creating project management methodologies, bringing in lean, bringing in agile, and you know the business systems modernization project, which I knew about coming in, was was daunting. Uh, but I also cataloged all of the projects that the IT team was involved in and found that it came to over 70 projects for our small team, ranging from we needed to replace our phone system to we needed to replace our ERP system. We needed to build web-based um, tools to pre present uh, data that had been printed previously in access databases to we were supporting micro-simulation models that have been built for 20 years uh, and then it needed to be maintained and enhanced. Um, so there was just an overwhelming abundance of work and projects that needed to be managed. Uh, so we really had a toolkit that we were instituting uh, along with all of these projects. Um, we didn't really even have waterfall. So there was waterfall methodologies. We, we brought in lean. My first day at Urban was basically I walked into the uh, current state workshop for this proposal development process that Jared will talk about in a minute. Um, we had our CTO who had been there for 44 years, um, who is known as the institutional knowledge of the Institute, announced his retirement. So you'll see that we had sort of this project framework for 2015 uh, that includes at the top the existing system risk management, which is all about the, uh, the knowledge transfer that was required from our CTO. Um, all of this knowledge was in his head. He built our enterprise architecture. Uh, so we had a key risk there that we needed to address. Uh, similarly, our human capital management uh, system was being retired. We had been notified of this for several years, uh, but of course, June of uh, 2015 was approaching and that was the actual date when the system was gonna be retired. Uh, so we, we were able to um, explore new systems in basically November of 2014. We signed a contract for a new system in February of 2015. We kicked off in March and we went live in three months. And I think that's an example of a project where we really pulled from all of the different tools that were available. Um, the implementation of the system that we selected had sort of a methodology that was already in place. It was probably more waterfall. They have a prescribed method that they use um, that was really sort of sequential. Um, and then the lean, I think, came in in part because the system we selected had business processes that were built in. We did not take the safe route of just simply upgrading the existing system we had. We actually selected a new system that was based on where we wanted to go in the future. Uh, but it did require a lot of rethinking about how we manage our business processes. And then the Agile piece, I think, came in in that what made that project really successful and what made us accomplish it within three months was the fact that we had a cross-functional team of six people, two people from HR, two people from accounting and finance, two people from IT that were really empowered to run that project and make decisions. Um, I like to think in Agile that you have a person who's a product owner. Basically, that person needs to be able to make 80% of the decisions in five minutes or less, and we really had that person on the team. Um, so we moved quickly, we got it done. Um, there's nothing more motivating in a project than to be able to be continued to be paid. Uh, so that was highly motivating for that project. Um, and so now we've just recently deployed phase two and then we're embarking on a continuous improvement uh, uh, path there. Uh, we're currently working on replacing our ERP solution. We currently are um, we're working with a consultant who's helping us document. They've documented our current state uh, and then they're now helping us document our future state desires. So we're expecting to go into the selection of a system there by the end of the year. Uh, and then as Khalid mentioned, there's a lot of work going on with our CRM. Uh, we don't have that at, currently at Urban. So it's not just a, it, it's an interesting project in that IT is kind of leading the evolution of a CRM, uh, but it really needs to be driven by our business uh, owners. So we're almost educating them to be able to drive that project going forward and really understand the value of CRM. So underlying all of these uh, initiatives that we have is really the operational excellence. And this is where the lean comes in, the agile, um, where we're really looking at transforming the culture of the organization, not just the technologies. Um, so there's really a framework of, of all of these pieces hopefully coming together um, and making a lot of change uh, in a very short amount of time for an organization. 
So again, you know, we picked out uh, our sort of documented our core value stream for, for urban and our first uh, uh, exercise in lean was really picking the opportunity value stream, which is really critical to the business. This is how we are getting new proposals, new funding opportunities to keep urban, you know, viable as a business. Uh, so that was really where we started our lean activity. And I'm going to turn it over to Jared, who's going to talk a little bit more detail about the actual lean experience that we had with the proposal development process. Great, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Salud. Um, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to come and share our story with you. I um, I was really inspired yesterday uh, by Sylvia um, from the uh, Italian uh, arm of PNB that really focused on the human story of Lean and how it sort of affected the people in her office. And so that's the story that I really wanna share with you today. You've heard a lot about uh, the sort of details of the work and, and how much we had to do and how excited we were, but none of it happens, right, without the people um, who are so dedicated to the work and so committed to the mission of Urban. So um, how many, can I get a quick show of hands, how many people have participated in a value stream mapping activity? Great, so most everybody here, you're gonna be very familiar with some of the pictures that I'm about to show you. Um, so this was the first time the Urban Institute had ever done anything even remotely like this activity. It was the first time we ever sat down and said, how are we doing this work? And can we do it better? And so um, what we did, um, as many of you have probably done in value stream mapping is got, a cross-functional team. And so we found a process that was actually incredibly massive. Um, we were looking for individual discrete process steps uh, in the way that we submitted proposals, and we found actually 50 distinct process steps that had to be mapped and sort of categorized. And um, so identifying them and, and thinking about the way that they worked was really challenging because our organization is so federated. We have as you heard, 10 policy centers. Each one has individual operations, methodologies, and processes that they use. It's not standardized across the organization. So trying to do that for the first time was incredibly challenging. Um, so uh, in the group, we had um, some incredible institutional knowledge um, and, and some really committed people from all different levels of the organization and all different job categories. So this was our uh, current state of the proposal process. So this should look familiar to some people who have tackled a challenging process before. Um, uh, the yellow are process steps and the pink are the issues, of course, that we encounter on a pretty regular basis. So you can see that this was a process that a lot of people encountered a lot of pain around. It was something that people didn't love doing, it was something they had to do, and they encountered incredibly high stress levels when they needed to do it. Because at Urban, we have a sort of kill what, or eat what you kill model. So if you're able to raise money for your work, then you're, you can stay employed. <laughs> Um, and continue to do the research that you want to do. Um, so it, people's livelihoods depended on this process, and it was, um, it was really emotional, actually, to see people and the way that they were interacting with a process that was so broken. So um, this is what it looked like mapped in Visio. So this is not a process that I think anyone would really want to try to navigate. Um, so I just want to tell you a couple of the stories of the people that you see in this uh, picture. It's not, it's a little uh, washed out here, so I'm just gonna sort of call your attention here a little bit. Um, this lovely young lady right here is Nancy Pindis. She's a senior economist, and she looks at the way that um, human service delivery programs affect indigenous populations in the United States. Um, so do food stamps uh, for Native Americans actually raise them up out of poverty? Uh, the answer is yes, in case anyone's interested. Um, but she's been with the organization for 40 years. She was one of the most outspoken, vocal detractors of this process. She was not interested in being taken away from her work. She was not interested in uh, joining in a collaborative process around um, process improvement. 
Um, and as many of you have probably experienced, some of your most vocal detractors in new process uh, mapping or in these kinds of conversations ultimately can become your biggest supporters. And so that was what we found with Nancy. Once she had the opportunity to, to share with us her experiences around proposal management and around her frustration with it and really be heard, it was incredible the transformation in her perspective about lean and about the way that we could use it moving on uh, with, with the Urban Institute. Um, this, uh, there's me, um, but this is Joelle Miller. Um, she's an operations manager for one of our largest centers that looks at human service delivery. Um, and she, uh, she really voiced one of, I think, the, the best perspectives at the end of the process. She described it as cathartic. So one of the, the big wins, even if you don't, I mean, that process was massive, right? There was no way we were going to ultimately totally revolutionize that in, in two months. But one of the best things that came out of this um, was getting all of these people together and making sure that senior researchers heard the perspective of the operations team, making sure that the contracts and management people heard the perspective of the researchers because that had never happened before at the Urban Institute where people from across these different kinds of perspectives came together and actually listened to one another. And so she said it was a really cleansing experience that all of this stuff she had bottled up in managing the operation side of this process, she could finally share and really be heard. So I think that that was one of our sort of key victories. Um, so, and then as you know, in, in, in you know, state mapping, we did a future state. Um, we sort of eschewed swim lanes because it, it was sort of too complicated. <laughs> um, and, and we mapped out what our sort of streamlined process should look like. And all of this blue down here, each one of those is a discrete activity, an improvement activity that we would have to do before we could actually achieve this future state. So as you can see, we had a huge, incredibly daunting task ahead of us. And I should mention, of course, that this happened over a two week uh, workshop activity that was led uh, by Steve Bell. We couldn't have done it without him. It was really fantastic to have his vision and leadership there. Um, and um, yeah, one last thing I want to mention um, is about the power of lean to, to transform communities of practice and also people's lives. So when I started this process, I was actually on the operations side um, in one of the research centers. And there was something that so attracted to me, attracted me um, to lean um, in these ideas of empowering people, in these ideas of uh, streamlining process and, and creating efficiency. Um, that by the end of the uh, workshop, I was with Steve leading sessions. I was so um, empowered and energized by this process. And so that was what really led um, us to form as a team and think about how we could work together in the future. So um, we you know, sort of mapped how we would approach these actual tactical improvements using impact and ease. Um, and then these are just a couple of examples. This was like what it looked like before, difficult to read, difficult to navigate. And we sort of streamlined some products and came out with some other guidelines and other ways that we thought we could improve the process. Um, and then one of the last things that we did was we sort of challenged this idea that technology has to be last, that process and people development is like the core of lean. I think we can, we can all say that that's, that's true. Um, one of the things that we decided was if our technology is 30 years old, what's the point of improving a process around a 30-year-old technology? We're designing a, a totally outdated process that once we replace the technology, we'll have to start again. So we challenged that and said, how can we bring in best of breed technology that will actually impact and transform our process? Um, and so then from there, we moved on to thinking about other kinds of processes that we could improve using Lean. Um, and I'm going to hand it back to Laura to talk about how we use Lean to transform our IT team uh, and Agile. Yeah, super. Thanks, Jared. Um, so yeah, we, we used Lean, obviously, for some of our process improvement work. But we also brought in Agile methodologies. We found that Lean was really good for the, the, um, the high um, volume, but you know, very consistent processes, whereas we needed to introduce Agile to handle some of the more tactical work that was happening that was maybe more um, infrequent, more experimental, 
um, that needed to be rapidly deployed. So we've been been experimenting with sort of a balance between lean and agile to to make the work happen. Specifically within the IT teams, as you've seen, um, we created agile teams. Uh, we we brought in a lot of visual management. There's a lot of post-its in our walls now. We're using Jira for our stories, um, and we're using color coding to map to to make sure that the the agile work that we're doing is actually mapping to our strategic goals of the organization. Um, so we have Kanban boards going for the actual tactical implementation of some of the process improvement work that we've started in Lean. Um, and we have various teams that are managing their work through post-its as well as through the electronic um, means. Uh, and then we've also spread Agile beyond just IT. I mean, obviously, traditionally, it, it worked immediately well for our two software um, development teams. We've got actually a very high-performing now infrastructure and operations team that's using Agile, even though a lot of their work is sometimes unpredictable. Um, but we've also extended it. This is a board that's being used by our communications team to manage their, um, you know, their marketing, advertising work. We have some of the researchers that we've now infiltrated. We have some of our administrative teams. So uh, whereas with Lean, I think we started out with a big bang, and we started out with a big process. And I think yesterday, one of the lessons learned that, that we up are, are thinking about is that you should really start small. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, but I think with Agile, we did start small, and we're with more grassroots, and we're sort of um, creeping up through the organization. So we have two different methodologies that we're really trying to, to explore and expand on in the organization based on what seems to fit best. Um, so, Kalud and Jared, I don't know if we want to just sort of sum up by talking about our lessons learned in this journey that we've started. So, yeah, so one of the, I don't know, so, um, one of the lessons learned for us was uh, really, as I said, we realized that yesterday we were like, oh my God, we really went with the most complex uh, process that is so critical for the organization. Um, so that was, I think, a, a major lesson for us uh, because we started seeing recently, although things moved, used to move slowly at Urban, uh, but after we did this workshop and people were excited, I have people now saying, oh, so what happened with the proposal? We didn't see the improved pro pro uh, proposal process. Uh, so we realized that it was such a complex process that we could not really deliver the automated dream, I would say, uh, solution, although we are scheduled in December to release the automated workflow of the proposal management in Salesforce. Uh, but still, we did learn that uh, it was too complex to handle um, and it challenged people's approach to critical type of work. Um, the other thing that we learned is that today, uh, because as we started looking at what today's systems are, and we noticed a trend in what, what is called today, I think Gartner call it postmodern ERP systems, uh, that they are actually more process driven than data driven. Like the, the, the big players in the ERP system, they're all about the data and how you really flow the data between the different uh, parts of an ERP system. But the newer ones, and I'm not gonna name them, um, they are really process driven. They are, uh, so that could actually change when we want to think about technology as we think about a lean transformation or a process improvement. That maybe if if the system or the technology is process oriented, maybe it becomes an uh, any kind of a tool that could be leveraged immediately and help us actually even envision what the process could look like. Um, especially if a system is flexible and configurable, where if we don't get the process right from the first time, as we continue to improve it, it could be also reflected in the system and the technology. Um, I think we also, one of the lessons learned is we we really choose the, the, the method or whether it's agile, it's lean, process improvement, whatever we call it, uh, we decided that flexibility really helped us. Um, and we had to go with whatever worked. We did not push people to really follow a rigid a process improvement process and value stream. When we felt agile might be a little bit more helpful, we kind of switched to that and we, we ended up using a mix of methodologies with whatever fit and we're still continue to be open to whatever type of uh, methods, tools, tactics and strategies that could help. Um, 
So the combi combination, I would say, of Agile and Lean really, really helped us. Um, I think the leadership commitment was crucial. Um, in an organization that has been working for so long in a certain way, and as I said, stable, delivers quality of work. Um, so the commitment from leadership and their sponsorship really was uh, super important. And one of the areas we're trying to explore is how we can continue to coach them and uh, keep them excited about the journey so they can continue to support. Um, and I think the other piece um, that we also um, learned through this is that Agile actually helped the team and Lean, both the compounds and the different methods we used, really helped our IT team um, have visibility into each other work. The model that IT worked with before was very um, uh, kind of separate. We had programmers who mainly work with research and they had no idea what other folks on the IT team do. Um, and with the first stand-up meetings and sharing what everybody is working on, they started like, oh, wow, you're working on this interesting project. So it brought amazing visibility into each other work and also gave the the, the IT team visibility towards the organization. So uh, many people now, they, when they work, they walk around the IT area, they see like, oh my God, you have all this work. And it's not that today they have more work than the, they had before. They actually probably had more because they had complex system to manage. Uh, but now it's more visible. It's, it's very transparent. So IT is not anymore this black box that nobody knows what's happening there. Um, uh, I'm not sure what other. Lessons um, learned. I'll just say one, and then we probably have just a couple of minutes left for questions. We really want to hear from you. Um, but one of the things that I think was really challenging for me leading teams or helping teams in operational excellence and, and managing uh, tactical process improvement was that Agile is so much, as Laura said, about teams leading themselves and being empowered to own products, right? And um, for an organization that is is totally unfamiliar with that concept. We would have agile groups that we would go to and say, okay, we're really excited about the work you're doing. What do you want to do with it? What should we do next? And they're like, oh, you, you, you're, tell us, tell us, what should we do? And we are, you know, so that was this total mind shift for people that, no, you're empowered. This is your work. What do you want to do next? And so that, you know, the training and coaching is so, so important. We can't stress that enough. So I think that's my final sort of takeaway. Super. Thank you.